Current popular Reddit thread begs the question, would you vote for Bernie if he ran again in 2024? And if so, why? One user said, the I am once again memes would be insane. <laughs> but others said things to the effect of, young progressives get too entangled with identity politics though. Bernie's worldview seems to be lifting the have nots up without regard for who or what they are. It's a much more unifying way to look at things. Meanwhile, Donald Trump's former chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, believes The Rock could win the 2024 presidential election if he ran. So that gives you a range of the potential <laughs> options, I guess. The Rock uh, to, to Bernie. Um, Bernie, you know, it, it's, there's no way to say that he's too old to make another go of it because they're that all would, too old. That's what uh, Diane Feinstein way, kicking about. <laughs> way too old, so he certainly could. The left, and I guess I'm, I'm curious for what you think about this, Brianna, but it, it seems to me as an outsider to the left that there's not, uh, there's not a very deep bench. I mean, just for the Democrats in general, but also for the progressives, uh, there, there's not a obvious successor to a Bernie who has that kind of um, uh, charisma and resonance. And, and it reminds me, you know, as a libertarian, of the kind of Ron Paul phenomenon, which mm -hmm. was so big throughout my college years and then into the start of my career. Mm -hmm. Ron Paul being this you know, chief animating figure among uh, young, non-left-leaning people. Mm -hmm. And then there was not, and then after he was kind of done, there wasn't anybody else to step up. Or I mean, I guess there was Rand Paul, but he's more of a main, main, somewhat more mainstream Republican figure. Yeah, I think that's right. Look, there have been articles asking this question most recently, uh, a couple about Marion Williamson's per per perspective run and one about uh, asking whether Rokana was gonna run. I asked Rokana this question recently on my show. He said absolutely no to 2024, but there was some equivocation about uh, 2028. And I think that part of the frustration with a lot of folks who could be in the position to be the next progressive leader is that they've been very visibly positioning themselves thusly. And, and because they've done so, they don't have that same sense of integrity that Bernie Sanders d did as someone who worked for all of those years kind of under the radar without these presidential ambitions. That seems to be the singular quality that's missing, that, mm -hmm. that Bernie Sanders was this guy who really seemed to be in it for the right reasons. And all the upcoming, most of the up and coming progressives, people like Pramila Jayapal and Ro Khanna, aren't perceived in that same light because it seems like they are jockeying hard right now for leadership positions within a Democratic Party establishment that is very obviously hostile to progressive interests. I mean, I, Robbie, I doubt you voted for Bernie to, <laughs> I did the not. first time. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, I would assume, Brianna, that you did. I know I, I did. Um, so, you know, would I vote for him again after voting for him the first time around? I, you know, I mean, I'm not certain if I would or wouldn't. My, my only concern now with the progressive faction, uh, I mean, and I used to call myself a progressive, I don't really know what to label myself now, is that I feel like the priorities have shifted. Hmm. So there was a period of time where it was all about Medicare for all, getting money out of politics, uh, reducing the defense the, you know, defense budget, which I know Bernie still screams about, uh, you know, many of these things. But I feel like the actual progressive base has shifted even Bernie's politics. You know, when he really focused on economics mostly, now I feel like he's he's shifted a bit and now he does get into that, cancel, you know, the culture war stuff um, that I think is actually toxic for the party. And I actually think that's why Bernie and Trump didn't do as well in this last election was because both of them veered away from what made them popular, which was talking about the middle class, building up the middle class. And they instead kind of went into these more um, culture war issues that I think most Americans don't care about, you know, unless you're on Twitter or something. So, so I, you yeah. know, I don't know. I, I mean, I just think that with Bernie, you know, my, my worry is, OK, maybe I still agree with many of the things that he wants to put out there. But would he actually have any progress with those with those issues when so much of the base is no longer seemingly there with him on it? So I do think that that idea that Bernie uh, became too woke, I, those aren't the words he used, but that's an argument that people put out there a lot for the difference between 2016 and 2020. And I do think that there was a difference there, but it was less that Bernie said anything especially woke. People have a hard time pointing to examples when I press them on what Bernie did or what he weighed in on that they th thought he should have weighed in on. But I think you're right to identify that there was less of an emphasis on some of the core economic issues and less fire from Bernie in his mm -hmm. approach to Joe Biden as someone like Hillary Clinton, who he seemed to have some like 
genuine antipathy for, something that many Americans <laughs> felt. And he was much more willing to say she is corrupt. She takes corporate money. She is bought and sold in a way that he refused to say about Joe Biden, who he kept characterizing as his right. friend. And there was that famous moment on the campaign where Zephyr Teachout, uh, who was a surrogate, uh, had a, a campaign approved article that was published in The Guardian and the campaign wouldn't stand by it, withdrew it and said that they don't believe that Joe Biden is corrupt. And that unwillingness to really right. attack power in that way is what made the effort seem more neutered in 2020. Right. There was that. Plus, I just kept hearing him say, and we're not going to vote for racism and sexism and bigotry. And, you know, I just kept hearing those words over and over and in, over. In 2016, that was like a, a I don't think he did nearly course. as much. All right, no, well, because he wasn't running against Trump, really, you know, in that, yeah. you know, in this last election, it was everybody was just trying to beat Trump. Mm -hmm. But in 2016, he was going up against Hillary Clinton. So he was talking about corruption and mm -hmm. more of the things you just pointed out. But in 2020, it shifted. and It was like racism and sexism and bigotry. And it was just <laughs> over the top. And I was like, come on, you know, like, let's focus on the actual bread and butter issues. It, it also that doesn't. I don't think it it doesn't matter hugely who if Bernie or someone else tries to run in 2024. I mean, Biden is going to be I think Biden is going to be the Democratic Party's nominee 2024 with like a 99.9 .9 percent guarantee. I don't know. And I, I mean, he, know. unless his if his approval ratings get below like 10 percent, maybe then. But he just has so much institutional backing. A, the, a successful primarying of a sitting president seems just totally well, I think beyond that any, yeah, he, he would have to, Biden, I guess, would have to decide that. But Biden is absolutely not going to decide well, that, that's, not to run. I think that would be the no scenario one decides that Joe not Biden to run. decides not to run. No one who has run. power decides, sure, here's my power. I'm going to set it aside and like yield. Like that just, that that is even more unthinkable. Well, there is conversation. There are, there's quite a, a bit of patter about that being the eventuality and that it, that there's an effort to minimize the risk of what that means for the Democratic Party by basically selecting and inaugurating uh, a successor the same way that they've basically chosen successors in a lot of other context. And the names mm -hmm. on the table are P. J P. Buttigieg and Amy oh. Klobuchar that they still want to make happen. I expect there will be this feud between yeah. Klobuchar and Buttigieg and Harris and then whoever is the progressive standard bearer. But that's going to be down the, down the gonna, road. You know, I she's don't... already, uh, no one's going to, I mean, they, tr yeah. they tried forcing Harris on us. I mean, that's what they've been doing, and people yeah. just are not taking to her. So she's out. I don't, for, I don't know what they're going to do with her. I don't want her to do it. But that, that really raises the question, is there going to be a sincere progressive that seems genuine and can capture some of that Bernie magic Energy, who participates right, yeah. in that open field? If there is an open field and there is no progressive who is able to pick up Ber the Bernie mantle, that'll be an incredible indictment on the state of the movement and frankly might lend a lot of folks who might think Bernie's time has passed to be willing to give him a second look. Yeah, I already think the movement has, I, I don't think that there is, I, I think if there is somebody that comes through with that Bernie-like magic in the future, it won't be coming from the progressive base. It'll come from somewhere else, uh, you know, and possibly it would come from the right this next time. And that energy and that magic was about the middle class, focusing on the middle class, building the middle class. It's dwindling and it's getting worse and worse and worse as we've seen inflation rise, the, the wealth trickling up to the richest and the, the middle class dwindling more into poverty. So somebody that can capture that magic is gonna be that person that can actually speak to that middle class. And I just don't think that's the progressive base anymore. Hmm. Damning, damning indictment. Yeah, I, again, for 2024, it's going to be the president is going to be Biden or Trump or DeSantis, I think. Like and what happens to everybody who theory. did have an appetite for progressive politics? Like, I, I don't I don't know that I agree with you, Kim, that the energy is going to come from the right, because I think there is just as much, frankly, more bad faith and corruption coming out of the, the generator of up and coming right wing talent. I can't imagine, course, frankly, yeah. who it would be. But the reality is the people haven't changed. The people who wanted more out of their politicians and saw Bernie as someone who was unbossed and unbothered, someone who was actually literally free from corporate corruption because he wasn't taking those big dollar monies and everyone else. Remember Joe Biden took more money from billionaires than anyone else in the race, something that got erased from the terrain in the conversation about why he isn't able to pass anything at this point in time. Those people are still there. And in fact, they're in worse straits, more st economically stressed, living with inflation and a bigger gap between their incomes and inflation that they were back in 2016. And every stat that Bernie used to recite from the podium, about 68,000 people dying a year from a lack of health insurance, and on and on and on, is, has only been exacerbated over the course of this crisis. And those people are hungering for someone somewhere to go. 
And I hope somebody steps up to meet the moment. The per, but the perception, to Kim's point, is that the left is just going to serve them up more anti-racism training. To deal right. With it's things. just all about racism I, and white supremacy. Wait, I'm sorry. At this the point. idea that Bernie Sanders from the podium no, 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 not Bernie, was not Bernie doing Sanders. anti-racism. No, absolutely the not them. Bernie Sanders. Okay. But whoever is going to replace Bernie Sanders as the standard bearer for the left is going to face enormous pressure from progressive it, activists, the, from the people guys, who care about this like stuff, AOC. to only if, focus on... Yeah. If, if they're doing anti-racism training, if they're doing woke speak, they're fundamentally not left to begin with so i'm not even i'm not even thinking of people who are in, the, in that realm obviously we're talking about someone who is a bernie style candidate and i agree with you that there aren't very many names on on the horizon i mean i do think that there was something provocative about the conversation around um marion williamson because she was this outsider candidate that did pique a lot of people's interest she was the most googled person on that second night, uh, debate night stage, and she was very quickly kind of disposed with after that. Um, it seemed like there was some concern about how much interest there was, if their backlash against her was any indication. But whether or not she can capture, to Kim's point, that, that grassroots middle class energy and speak to the needs of the populace in this moment is, you know, who knows if she'll run it and that remains I to mean, be seen. I mean, but again, to Kim's point, the, the clear to me progressive or uh, once progressive, once part of the Bernie coalition figure now generating tons of right wing uh, and Republican appreciation and actually more welcome in Republican circles is, you know who I'm going to say, Gabbard. Tulsi mm -hmm. Gabbard. <laughs> so, right. That's, right. I think she might actually be the future. I mean, it's exactly what you were saying, Kim. Some of the, some of the, she's going to capture some of that attention. Possibly, we'll have to see. Yeah, possibly, right. Well, we'll uh, or the plenty rock. more time to hash out uh, this conversation uh, for every day for the foreseeable future. So <laughs> stick with us for more rising after this.